Então, eu gostaria de chamar a doutora Sherry Barron para compor a mesa e o doutor Keio Pavairinta. Vou falar brevemente um pouco da, da história da, profissional deles, antes de passar para a fala. A doutora Sherry Barron ela é médica do trabalho e professora de saúde do trabalhador e saúde ambiental na Universidade da Cidade de Nova York, City University of New York. Antes do seu trabalho atual, ela trabalhou por 25 anos na NIOSH, o Instituto Nacional de Saúde e Segurança Ocupacional, onde desenvolveu vários programas de vigilância em saúde do trabalho, é, alguns específicos, como o desenvolvimento da vigilância em saúde e o programa de tratamento para os trabalhadores envolvidos no resgate do colapso do World Trade Center. É, outro trabalho que ela mesma destaca foi os projetos de melhoria nos sistemas de vigilância nos locais de trabalho para os trabalhadores de baixos salários e imigrantes nos Estados Unidos. Trabalhou também na Organização Pan-Americana de Saúde, na OPAS, por dois anos no México, ajudando os mexicanos a melhorarem seus programas de vigilância em saúde do trabalhador. Uh, o segundo palestrante é o Dr. Keio Paivarinta. Ele é inspetor-chefe na Agência Regional Administrativa do Estado, no sul da Finlândia, na Divisão de Saúde e Segurança do Trabalho. Em setembro, agora, ele assumirá como chefe da Unidade de Vigilância, tendo começado como inspetor dessa agência em 1980, onde, na maioria das vezes, ele vem atuando na fiscalização do setor da construção civil. Agora, ele também é encarregado no grupo de coordenação do setor de construção dos Ministérios de Assuntos Sociais e da Saúde. Desde o final de 1980, ele tem, tem desenvolvido muitos tipos de novos métodos de vigilância e aplicação desses métodos em saúde e segurança do trabalho. Alguns desses métodos já foram publicados em formas de artigo. E, e esse ano ele foi nomeado para compor o comitê editorial da nova revista científica ORP Journal, que é uma revista eletrônica de língua espanhola na Universidade de Catalão, em Barcelona. Quero dizer que é uma grande honra tê-los aqui conosco. Agradecer imensamente vocês terem interrompido as férias porque para ambos, agosto é um mês de férias, e eles interromperam uma semana para passar aqui com a gente, ajudar a gente a pensar um pouco essas questões. Quero agradecer profundamente a honra de tê-los aqui. Eu passo a palavra para a professora Cherry. Então, é so, um, it's a prazer estar aqui. Eu gostaria de agradecer os organizadores por me convidarem. Nos últimos dias, eu tive a oportunidade de participar nos seminários And it was very interesting to learn all about what is going on in Brazil. And mainly what I learned is that Brazil and the United States has a lot of similarities. They're big countries, they're very diverse, but also we as um, investigators interested in workers' health are facing many of the same challenges with the changing nature of work in both the United States and Brazil that um, poses many challenges for us, but also keeps our work interesting and exciting. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about the um, systems of surveillance, or vigilance as you call them, for um, fatalities, but I'll also talk a little bit about non-fatal accidents in the United States. Okay, so um, why is this an important topic? I know I'm already speaking to people who are convinced of this, but in the United States there were 4,628 workers who were killed on the job in the United States, 
That's uh, about 12 or 13 workers every single day. And there were nearly 4 million non-fatal um, injuries that occurred to workers in the workplace in the United States. And um, these are very costly. In the United States, it's been estimated that the total cost of fatal and non-fatal injuries is $192 billion per year. So we're talking about something that's very costly to both the worker and to society. And I know all of us, through your manifesto and other things, are trying to convince our general public of how important it is to think about prevention, because we all know that most of this money can be saved. Um, so I'd like to start just with um, one story, because I think tell, uh, telling a story is always very helpful to understand what we're talking about. And I need to grab my uh, English translation of this. Um, so this is a story. Um, it's actually written in uh, Brazilian because it's about a young Brazilian worker uh, who lived around uh, Boston, Massachusetts. As many of you probably know, in Boston um, or in Massachusetts, I think it has the largest population of Brazilians outside of Brazil. Um, and so this was a story that had a very big impact both on the Brazilian community in um, Boston, but um, also in thinking about injuries to uh, young workers. So I'll read it in English, but you can read it there in Portuguese. In February 2004, tragedy struck when a Brazilian worker was assaulted during a shoplifting li incident. The victim, an 18-year-old male, was fatally stabbed during an assault outside of the store. The victim was employed by a local pharmacy where he provided general help. The shoplifter exited the store with stolen items and the store manager went after him. The 18-year-old worker noticed that the shoplifter had stabbed the store manager and went outside to help his boss. While trying to help his boss, the 18-year-old was fatally stabbed by the shoplifter. So um, this is a, a, a tragic example, and it really makes us um, think about what we're talking about when we're talking about fatal injuries. Um, I, I, uh, uh, Renata mentioned that uh, it's our vacation time, but I also took advantage of this to travel around Brazil for a couple of weeks, and I visited not only um, Sao Paulo, but Rio and Salvador. Um, and so anytime you visit a country, it's always wonderful to visit the museums. Um, and so I fell in love with many of the Brazilian painters. And you can see here, um, it became very clear that the, th the theme of workplace injuries has been important in Brazil. And you can see it represented by this um, painter, Eugenio Sigat, excuse me if I pronounce that wrong, but he did this painting, Accidents of Workers, in 1944. And, oops. Uh, we also, f I, I most loved Candido Port Portinario. He's a, a, a wonderful painter, and again, he shows uh, uh, workers in the coffee industry in 1935 and clearly shows some of the um, hazards that they face. Um, and so as I said, I, we loved uh, Candido Portinari. Um, just to see, I'm going to give you a little test to see, because I know right after lunch everyone uh, can begin to fall asleep. Who in the audience knows what um, this painter died of? Someone shout it out. <laughs> uh, he died in 1962 from uh, lead poisoning from the high levels of lead that were in the paints that he used in his paintings. So um, uh, he was a great painter who depicted workers and then himself was a victim of workplace injuries. But before I came to Brazil, this was probably the the, the thing I knew most about injuries in Brazil um, since the World Cup got the most publicity around the world and um, I don't know exactly how many workers were killed in the construction of the stadiums, but this was one worker, Fabio Hamilton da Cruz, 
who fell 26 feet while helping to install temporary seats in um, one of the stadiums. So what I'm going to talk about um, in this is how we in the United States approach occupational health surveillance or vigilance. Um, and I'm going to be focusing mainly on the systems from the federal and state governments. Um, I know that the speaker after me is going to be talking more about uh, surveillance within uh, particular uh, facilities or plants, so it'll be a nice compliment. Um, but, but most importantly, throughout my talk, I'll be discussing the theme of how it's important not just to collect data, but to use data in order to improve the work environment. Um, so a little bit about a definition of what we mean by public health surveillance or vigilance. Um, so by surveillance, we mean a system that's very systematic um, and that's ongoing. So we collect data all the time, but what makes certain just regular data collection different from a surveillance system is that it's ongoing and continues year after year after year. And um, that data uh, is collected, but what's very important is that it's also analyzed and interpreted. Because there's many systems where data is collected by governments, um, and they collect lots and lots of data, and we never see the results of it. So a good surveillance system is one that is ongoing, systematic, and it involves the collection and analysis and interpretation of that data. Um, and then what's most important is that data has to be shared with the public for the purposes of prevention. So a surveillance system is not a good system if it doesn't get directly connected to prevention systems. Oops. Um, so the purposes of surveillance systems, there's many purposes. Uh, one important purpose is to target those industries or workers what, that are most important uh, for prevention, the highest prevention priorities. But surveillance systems can also be used to evaluate interventions. So when we discover a problem and we try and do something about it, it's also important to have data systems that allow us to know whether our interventions are working or not. They're also important for generating hypotheses for further research because surveillance systems generally only collect um, a, a very um, uh, few data points on a large number of people, but it's important then to do follow-up research uh, when priorities are determined. And um, the other thing that surveillance can be useful for is demonstrating the need for prevention. And this is often directed at policymakers because policymakers often need to see um, the numbers and the cost in order to be motivated to work. Um, there's many different types of occupational data that can be collected. So we can look at traumatic injuries, whether they're fatal or non-fatal. We can look at occupational illnesses like silicosis or lead poisoning. We can look at biological measures of exposure like um, blood lead levels. Um, there's also surveillance systems that look at levels of exposure within the workplace. So um, looking at levels of dust or metals across many different workplaces. And surveillance systems can also be used to look at how well interventions are being um, uh, carried out throughout a country. So for instance, you can have a surveillance system that measures the um, number of training programs or the types of training programs across a country. Um, there's also different types of surveillance systems. We have surveillance systems that are um, large representative systems like a national census and some of the big federal systems I'll describe to you. But what's also important is something called case-based surveillance. Um, and we've been hearing several case studies presented today in other people's presentations. And so these are um, surveillance systems that collect a lot of data on individual cases. And I have a um, quote there that someone said, which is, statistics are people with the tears washed off. And so I, I, I hope that got translated um, 
so you understand it. But the idea of case-based surveillance is um, to be able to really present stories of the people who are affected. Um, in the United States, uh, there was some uh, uh, information collected on workplace hazards, but there was nothing routine and systematic until 1970. It was not until 1970 that the Occupational Safety and Health Act was passed in the United States. Before that, we had no comprehensive law to protect workers in the United States. Um, but that law created two, two department, two programs in two departments. There's the Department of Labor, which has uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And um, it also empowered the Department of Health through the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, where I used to work. Um, and together, the Department of Labor and the Department of Health do um, surveillance and um, programs. Uh, there's also, in, in the United States, the um, individual states have a lot of political authority. And so uh, there's also uh, surveillance systems within 26 different states, so in about half of the states in the country. Um, and in the examples I'll be giving... So um, there's several key components in developing a surveillance system. And this is very important because what makes a surveillance system good is that it's set up systematically. So um, the components of setting up a surveillance system, the first is being very clear about how you're defining your cases. The second is to develop a systematic method for how you're going to identify the cases that you've just defined. The third is defining what data you're going to collect on each of the cases. And the last is figuring out what your denominator is. So what your, if you want to develop rates, you have to have a way of knowing how many workers there are in general in the country. Um, so uh, uh, the survey of occupational injuries and illnesses in the United States the way they define a recordable case is either a death, some medical treatment that was uh, required because of an injury, but the medical treatment has to be something beyond first aid, so things like getting a bandage or other simple medical treatment. Also, any case that involves a person having to be away from work for any number of days or being transferred to a different job um, or having to work in their current job but having some restrictions. Um, what's different about the system in the United States from, from uh, Brazil, uh, I've learned, is that you include injuries that are involved in transportation to work. And in the United States, that's not included. Um, it also includes illnesses, but illnesses, as you all know, are very complicated because illnesses often develop many years after a person is working. So the illnesses they count are ones that are uh, more likely to, to be recognized while the worker is working in the workplace. So um, skin problems, respiratory problems, poisoning, hearing loss, and then other things like um, heat exhaustion, cold, uh, blood-borne pathogens, radiation, et cetera. Um, the elements that are collected on each case, uh, there's uh, demographic uh, characteristics, age, sex, race, and for deaths, the birth, uh, the country where the person was born. Also things like the place where the injury occurred, the time, the industry, the occupation, and then information about what actually happened. And I'll be showing you examples of that later. Uh, so this is just uh, uh, an example of the form that's used. So this is in every workplace in the United States. The only ones that are excluded um, are agricultural employers with less than 11 workers. But all private sector uh, employers are required by law to fill out this form. Um, and this just shows you some of the details. Uh, there's the employee's name their job title, the date they were injured, 
um, where the event occurred, and some details about the injury. Um, there's also information about the severity, so um, the days away from work, if they were transferred, um, uh, and how they were transferred, and whether it's an injury or an illness, and these are the various illness categories. Um, then there's additional questions asked about each of the incidents. So um, what was the employee doing? So an example is they were carrying a ladder, uh, they were climbing a ladder while carrying tools. Um, then what happened? So for example, the ladder slipped on the wet floor. Um, what was the injury or illness? A sprained ankle. What object directly harmed the employee? The concrete floor. So this has to be filled out on each uh, worker. Um, so then it's very important to have a systematic way of coding these because you can't develop a system if you just have these long um, descriptions, it becomes very difficult to analyze it. So um, there's a systematic way of coding it, and I'll show you the example here. Um, so this says, a factory worker amputates his finger while his clothing is caught in a stamping machine. So the first thing that's coded is um, the nature. Um, so in this case, the nature is it was an amputation. The next thing that's coded is the part of the body, and so in this case it was his finger. Um, the next thing is the um, event, and so it was caught in a machine. Uh, the next thing is the source, so the stamping machine was the direct source of the injury, but there's also what they call a secondary source, and that was his clothing. So in this case, he was probably wearing clothing that was uh, you know, too loose or whatever, so that it w was caught in the machine. Um, so uh, then, we, in order to develop rates, we have to think about what our denominator is. Um, uh, what's done is, as I said, every employer has to fill out these forms, but a statistical sample is chosen of employers all around the country. They're contacted and they're told that they are required to submit those forms that I showed you, and that sample is used to generate uh, national statistics. And um, the information that's used for the number of workers in order to develop rates um, is something called a full-time equivalent worker. So um, instead of counting the number of workers, they count the number of full-time workers, which is equal to 2,000 hours of work per year. And so if a worker w works a lot of overtime, he would actually count as more than a single worker, and if he worked part-time, he would count as less than a full-time worker. Um, so this just shows you the results. Um, it shows you from 2003 to 2012. This is the rate of all cases, and this is the rate of cases that involved a person having to take days away from work or be transferred or be on restricted work. And, um, you know, the rate has been slowly going down, um, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion in the United States about whether this is because cases are being less likely to be reported, or if it's because of the recession, or if it's because employers are doing a better job of preventing injuries. Um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion and debate about that, um, which we could talk about in the discussion session. Um, and this just shows you um, some rates uh, by industry. So the average rate is three and a half workers per hundred workers. And not surprisingly, the industries you would expect are elevated. So this is agriculture, um, this is construction, this is manufacturing, retail workers, transportation workers, healthcare workers. And this is the, what we call the leisure and hospitality industry, like hotels and restaurants. 
So with all the data that's collected, there's many, many different kinds of charts and diagrams that you can develop. Um, this is just one as an example. So this shows the number of um, strains, sprains and strains by the type of exposure. And what we heard from various presentations, I think this is very consistent with what you're seeing in Brazil. So here you can see two-thirds of the sprains and strains were caused by what's called overexertion, which is repetitive bending, uh, lifting, repetitive movements, et cetera, uh, and a smaller portion by falls and slips. Um, so uh, that was just to give you an example of the kind of statistics, because there's many different statistics. But I think it's important to point out that uh, there's much work being done to try and estimate the um, percent of injuries that are missed by this system. And uh, we can say for sure that at least 30% are missed, and it could be as much as 60% um, higher. And there's many reasons why these um, injuries are missed. Uh, things like job insecurity and fear, so that workers are afraid to tell their boss that they're injured. Um, some employers don't necessarily record all of their cases. Um, we've talked a lot about precarious work and contracting out, and many contracted out workers may never get recorded in any particular system. And um, as we know, many illnesses go unrecognized. Um, and this is in my tours of Brazil. These are taken, and you can see here, um, this is something that we might see in the United States, too. So for instance, you have some very good jobs. Here's a window washer. He has a nice harness. He has a, um, a suction there, so he's held on to the wall. And then there's other workers here um, who don't have much protection at all. And uh, we know that these are workers who are better protected are the ones who are likely to show up in our statistics. And these workers who are much more likely to be injured probably never show up in the statistics at all. Um, so now to talk about um, translating data to action. So um, this is a very important thing. We collect data, we develop insights, but we need to take action. Um, when we decide about take, doing prevention, we can think about many different ways of setting priorities. We can choose the most serious things, like um, deaths. We can choose the industries with the highest rates, or we could ch choose the highest number of injuries. We can think about where we're most likely to be able to accomplish change. Um, we can think about the most vulnerable populations. And then we can think about issues of politics and funding. And all of these things go into thinking about prevention. Um, so uh, I'm just going to show you an example of how people came up with priorities and developing action. So here's our Brazilian young worker again. This took place in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and so uh, in Massachusetts, this this caused a lot of interest in injuries in young workers. Um, and so they decided to develop a, a whole uh, program to look at young workers. Uh, so their priority was vulnerable workers. Uh, and so they used both population-based and case-based surveillance, as I described. So what they did is they collected information um, from workers' compensation, from emergency departments, from deaths, from the uh, OSHA system that I just described to you. And then they did lots of interviews with teenagers, young workers, um, both with the workers themselves and with their employers. They did analysis um, and developed some prevention ideas. And I can just show you what they were able to accomplish. So here, these are workers 15 to 17 years old, and what they found is that there was a large number of injuries in the restaurant industry. Um, and then they looked even further at the types of industries, and so what they found, this is um, all restaurants and this is snack bars, and one of the things they found that they were very surprised is that there were a lot of burns occurring in restaurants. 
Um, and so then uh, they thought about how to take their data to, to um, cause action, and they thought about engineering changes, policy and enforcement changes, and education. Um, so they, in their investigations, what they found out was that one of the major causes of burns for um, uh, youth was that they were working uh, in the uh, uh, snack bars, specifically for Dunkin' Donuts. And um, this was the machine that made coffee. And what they were doing is they were pulling out the filters here, and it still had hot water in it. And so the hot water was coming back and burning them. So they spoke with the uh, manufacturers, and they manufactured a new filter system that has a little ledge on it so that it stops the water from coming back and burning them. Um, they also developed uh, information that they distributed to people, and they did it in many languages. So I show you here the, um, the one they did for uh, Portuguese. Uh, they also tried to develop policy changes, and they were able to strengthen the child labor laws in Massachusetts. Um, they came up with new enforcement proceedings. They had new laws about a supervisor had to be present after 8 o'clock, because they found that many times young workers were working alone, and a, a revision of the system for getting work permits. They also came up with a new... Uh, funding for training programs. So they developed programs in the community-based program for youth and some very, um, very successful programs where it was peer training, where young workers taught other young workers about safety and their rights in the workplace. So um, now I'm going to talk a little bit um, about specifically about fatal occupational injuries. It's the same uh, kind of uh, ideas and concepts we've been talking about before. So the case definition for fatal injuries specifically is um, damage to the body resulting from acute exposure to energy. It's a kind of a cumbersome de definition, but that can be from heat, electricity, a fall, absence of heat or oxygen, it has to occur within a single work day or shift, and it excludes uh, deaths due to heart attacks or strokes. So that's the official definition of a traumatic uh, injury, a fatal traumatic injury. So the way the federal government collects information because, as we said before, just using the workplace logs is not sufficient. So they also use things like death certificates, um, compensation records, newspaper clippings, medical examiner reports, police records. They have uh, more than 20 different sources of information. And uh, they need to have two separate independent verifications of this being a, a work death to count as a death. So this shows you the rate of deaths uh, uh, over time. This is between 1992 and 2012. And again, you can see the rate of deaths is going down slightly. Um, I think the effect of the recession here is much more obvious. Um, we see a big dip around 2007, and that's because we know many fatalities are related to construction work. And uh, during the recession, the amount of construction went way down. Um, this shows you um, rates instead of numbers. Um, and again, you can see the drop around uh, 2008 when the recession began. Um, this is the causes of fatalities um, in a pie. And I'll go through this um, uh, in a little more detail. So uh, the biggest cause of fatalities are trans transportation incidents. Um, and again, I have some cases for you in Portuguese, so, because um, again, I think it's important to have uh, uh, specific examples to understand the problem. So this is a roadway injury. A 49-year-old male city worker died while collecting waste from homes. Uh, 
The victims and a coworker were riding in the rear, rear step of the truck while traveling to the next collection location. The victim fell from the back of the truck as it drove over an indent in the road going about 30 uh, miles per hour. The victim landed on the road hitting his head against the asphalt. So then the um, uh, next most common cause of injuries is um, falls. Oops. Oops. It's going the wrong way. Um, so this is an example of a, a fall injury. Uh, a 38-year-old male construction worker employed by a construction company fell approximately 40 feet from the roof of a four-story residential building when he slipped while throwing a door from the roof into a dumpster below. And. The next most uh, thing is contact with objects or equipment. Okay, well, we, we skipped that case. But the next one is uh, struck by injury. And this is an example. A 38-year-old male cutter employed by a granite product manufacturing was trying to retrieve a granite slab from a holding rack with five granite slabs weighing approximately uh, two tons, fell over crushing him against a cement table. And then there's the example of violence by others and injuries, which is um, 17% that you can see here. And this is the example of the homicide that we already heard about of the Brazilian boy. So I'll, I'll skip this because this is another example. Um, and then the smallest cause is um, exposure to harmful substances in the environment. Um, And this is two tile installers, a 48-year-old male and a 58-year-old female died from carbon monoxide poisoning while installing tiles in a home under construction. There was a gasoline-powered generator operating in the garage and a propane heater operating in the house. Okay. So that just uh, gives you some examples of the types of fatalities, and I think it's important also to think about cases. But then we have to think about priorities. So when you have your surveillance system like this, this shows you the industries with the highest rates and numbers of fatalities. And uh, this is construction, transportation, and agriculture. And you can see here that it's very clear that these would clearly be um, priorities. But then we also have to make decisions. Um, this is manufacturing, which clearly has a, a large number of injuries, of uh, fatalities. But then mining has the highest, one of the highest rates of, um, of uh, fatalities. So again, it's important to think about uh, um, numbers versus rates. And then, uh, we can also look at our statistics by lots of things like um, the gender of the worker. So this bar here shows you female workers and this is male workers. Um, we can see that males and females are very similar for many things like roadway incidents, falls, fires and explosions, but they're very different. Homicides are a much more important cause of fatalities in women.
um, and con contact with objects is more important for men. And if you have a good surveillance system, you can look even further. So it's interesting that uh, for both men and women, robbers are an important cause of homicides. Uh, but for women, you can see here very interestingly that a large proportion of the deaths on the job due to homicide were because a relative or a de domestic partner actually came to the workplace and killed their partner there. So being able to collect this kind of information is important in thinking about prevention possibilities. Um, you can also look at things like um, the ethnicity and race of workers. So this shows you the Hispanic workers. Um, and interestingly, we found that Hispanic workers uh, are, uh, uh, have a higher rate of fatalities, but most of the fatalities are among um, immigrant Hispanic workers. So these are new immigrants who have come to the United States to work, and they're much more likely to be working in these kinds of jobs compared to these kinds of jobs. Um, we can also look at age. So very interestingly, the rate of injuries for, for workers over age 65 is much higher than for other ages, and it actually goes up with age. So that's another way that you can prioritize your interventions. Um, when you have a sy systematic system for collecting information, it also means that you can compare your information to other countries. So this shows you a comparison with the European Union. Interestingly, the United States, the rate of fatal injuries is much higher compared to the European Union in most, um, in most industries. Um, so again, we can do this kind of population-based surveillance, but case-based surveillance is also very important. Um, and so let me briefly tell you about something called the Fatal Assessment and Control Evaluation Program called FACE. This is something done by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. It's a surveillance system that's done um, by the federal government and states. And the idea is to put a face on um, injuries, on fatalities. Um, currently, they're prioritizing construction falls, machine-related uh, um, fatalities, the energy industry, and immigrant workers. Um, it's conducted by NIOSH and nine different states, and they develop recommendations um, and do in-depth evaluations. Um, but I want to show you some examples of how these kind of in-depth evaluations can go from data to insights to action. Um, and again, thinking about action involving engineering, changes, policy and enforcement, and education. So this is an example again in Boston. Um, it was an example where the workers, these workers are refinishing wood floors. And what happened was there were fires in um, various buildings where these workers were, um, were doing this refinishing. And, you, um, and so this is the story. In Boston, there were more than 25 fires caused by wood floor installation and refinishing. In two years, three Vietnamese floor finishers were killed in fires because of flammable lacquer sealer. So what they, the lacquer they put on the floor caught fire. Um, and so what happened is they were putting the sealer on it, and the, um, the spark from the refinishing machines ignited the lacquer that was being used and caused an explosion and fire. Um, and so as a result of this, the state worked with a community task force. Um, they reached out to the Vietnamese community where um, in Boston, a lot of the floor finishers were Vietnamese small business owners. And so this was an example where reaching out to small business owners and working with them and educating about them about the problems got them to um, change the, policy, the, the procedures they used. And they discovered that you, there was a water-based lacquer that could be used instead. And eventually, the governor passed a bill 
that banned the use of flammable lacquers. So this is an example. Um, and it's, it's very important to write up your success stories so you get, uh, sh so you show how important surveillance is. So this was a system where uh, they used this surveillance system to uh, follow up and investigate and come up with engineering and policy changes that eliminated the problem. Um, uh, again, uh, we have the Brazilian worker, hold on, um, and this was the, uh, the forms uh, and dissemination of information about how young workers can um, uh, uh, protect themselves when they're working in these kind of retail uh, establishments. Um, another example, I said that fall-related injuries are um, very important industry injuries, and this is, uh, they're most common in the construction industry. This shows you a map of where, uh, just in one year, the construction falls occurred in the United States. And so um, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, based on this data, developed a big campaign. They call it Plan, Provide, and Train. This is the Spanish version of their website that has lots and lots of information about um, how to protect people. Um, and uh, they developed uh, a lot of information and things. I just wanted to show you an example of one of these, uh, so um, one of the things that they discovered is that in construction work, one of the challenges is that workers um, are working, uh, it's not a single workplace. There's usually just a couple of workers in a location and they're very isolated. Um, and so an example of some of the things they developed were these mobile applications that could be used on their mobile phones to make it more safe. Um, and this is an example of uh, a lot of construction falls are caused by uh, ladder safety problems. So this is the, the mobile app um, that can be gotten. You could download it yourself. And it has a very nice little thing uh, one of the issues with ladders is that sometimes they're either too steep or too shallow, and so it's very important to get them at the right, uh, the right distance. And so, oops. what this um, app does is it actually gives you a signal, um, and you, you put your phone on the edge of the ladder, and it tells you um, when the ladder is at the, um, the right uh, level. Um, we've also recently developed an application. A number of people here were very interested. It's an application that workers can use themselves to collect hazards in their workplace. And so um, these are the screens. They can mark what kinds of equipment or hazards they have. They can mark their location, and they can also upload pictures of hazards. And this is actually something, something, oops. Uh, something we've been doing with this group of workers, who are all workers who have been working to do construction following the Hurricane Sandy. And so these are examples of some of the immigrant workers um, that, that sometimes get left out of surveillance systems. And so we've been developing this surveillance system so that they can collect the data themselves about the hazards in their workplace. So, in conclusion, um, occupational health surveillance is challenging, especially in large, complex countries like the U.S. and Brazil, uh, especially as we're facing all of these changing kinds of um, work conditions, contracting out, etc. Um, but systematic data that's well collected can be used to raise awareness about work-related problems. But it's only one important step 
in preventing injuries and illnesses, and it has to be coupled with all sorts of actions, like some of the actions that I described for you today and that we've heard from many other presenters here today.